and good morning. I want to greet all of you in the name of the Lord and welcome you to Westminster Presbyterian Church. And we are delighted to have you here as we gather in the name of Christ to give Him praise and worship for His salvation. If you are visiting with us uh, this morning, welcome. We're glad you're here. We look forward to worshiping together, uh, lifting high the name of Christ. We would love to know that you're here. If you are visiting with us this morning, you could do that by just filling out one of those white Connect cards in front of you and dropping that in the offering plate as it goes by later. It's a chance for you to let us know how we can be praying for you. If you'd want to put any prayer requests there, uh, it's a chance for you to let us know who you are. We could reach out one time uh, and just get to know you. But uh, again, welcome, and we're glad you're with us this morning. In addition to worship this morning, we plan to be back together again tonight for an evening worship service. We are working our way through the book of Colossians in the evening, and as uh, Pastor Collins preaches this morning in our Proverbs series, I'll be preaching tonight in the Colossians series, so come if you would like to join us in Colossians chapter 3 uh, this evening. Looking ahead, just a, a couple of things to highlight on the, the schedule uh, for our church. Next week starts a new Sunday school quarter, and so if you are a participant in our adult Sunday school classes, uh, we would be helped if you would let us know what class you might uh, intend to participate in. Um, you could fill out uh, the form online or uh, at the registration desk, it just helps us out, but whether you do or not, come join us for a new quarter of Sunday school next Sunday. Also, uh, next week begins the Advent season, and that mostly impacts our evening services as we have a, a theme in preparation for Christmas. Our theme this year is Worship the King, and we'll be in, a, in an Advent series. We'll also have some Advent music, uh, so starting next Sunday evening. And then I also just uh, highlight that next Sunday morning is a Communion Sunday. Uh, so as you think this week and prepare your hearts to come around the Lord's table together next Sunday morning. Also just want to make a note, um, some of you may remember several years ago that we drove dozens uh, of our Congolese brothers and sisters here to church uh, every Sunday. Now. As they have been here, they've gotten driver's licenses, and we haven't had to do that much lately, but we have probably five to seven new families that have come to the area or the country recently who don't yet have their driver's license and who need rides to church. Now, the great thing is uh, the Swahili community is able to give them rides home. They're just not able to pick them up. And so we're looking for folks who would be willing to just do the pickup and drive uh, folks here. It could be at 9.30 in time for Sunday school. We have an ESL class for them, or it could be at 10.30 if, you are, uh, if that's more convenient for you. But if you would be willing uh, for the foreseeable future until this new group can get their driver's license to help get them here to church, uh, that would be a blessing to them. And finally, uh, it seems to maybe be a, a requisite announcement to draw your attention to a rosebud uh, up here as we have yet another blessing in our congregation. Uh, today we're announcing Florence Eleanor Clausinga, the daughter of uh, Justin and Sarah Clausinga. Some of you know that uh, Justin and Sarah just recently moved to New York, so you won't see Florence unless they're back here for a visit, but they are members. Uh, many of you know them, and we wanted to announce Florence's birth up there in New York this week. Well, I think uh, that is all that I will draw uh, attention to this morning by way of announcement. Our purpose for being here is to come into the presence of the Lord, and to give praise to our triune God, and to rejoice in the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. He is the one who calls us into his presence. He is the one who enables us to be in his presence, and he is worthy of all praise. In recognition of that, if you're able, would you stand with us? We'll use the words of the doxology as our call to worship, and then you'll have a few moments of silence to prepare your hearts.
Our God, we do come into your presence thankful for what you have done in Christ Jesus. I think back to the Old Testament when the priests and the Levites would begin every day and end every day by giving thanks to the Lord their God and praise to your name. It's what we are here to do this morning, Father, to give thanks to you for what you have done in redeeming us and drawing us back into your presence through Christ Jesus and to give praise to your name for you are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of praise in your character and who you are. You are worthy of all praise for the redemption you have brought through your own Son, Jesus Christ. So enable us this morning, Father, to praise you as you deserve. May you be glorified in us and through us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
singing to the one who's on the throne, but we're singing as those who still know our remaining sinfulness. And so it's appropriate for us to come and confess our sin together. Would you join me as we pray the prayer printed on the front of your bulletin? Almighty God, when exposed by the searchlight beam of Scripture, we are shocked to see how far we stray from you. With the gospel of grace ringing in our ears from Sunday, we still bow before idols of gold on Monday. We claim that you seem distant, though we are the ones who are lazy about prayer. We have trusted our own senses more than sure promises of your word. Father, thank you for substituting Christ's faithfulness in place of our poor performance. We rest in Jesus' cleansing blood and powerful resurrection. Amen. Having confessed our sins, hear the good news of the assurance of God's grace for us from 1 Timothy chapter 1, where we read, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. This is the grace of God for our salvation. Thanks be to God. We want to join our voices to those of God's people across the ages and around the world as we confess the Apostles' Creed together. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Catholic Church, in the communion of saints, in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This week we have a privilege we have usually uh, twice a year as we are welcoming among us new members this morning. And these folks have gone through 10 weeks. Uh, we put them through the ringer a bit uh, if they want to uh, join the church, not because there is a high bar. The bar is our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, but because we want to know you and you to know us. Uh, and we're just thrilled with those that God has called here to Westminster. So uh, we received some at 8 o'clock, but if you're wearing a carnation and are joining, I'll ask you to come up and meet me down front. You guys can just stand along the front here. Welcome. Come on up. We can stand along the front, stretch down as long as we need to.
Wonderful. We are so thankful for those that the Lord has brought here to Westminster. So thankful for what we've come to know about you, uh, and we look forward to the ways that the Lord will continue to bless us as you're, you're here. Our prayer is that together as a body, we will be speaking the truth and love to one another so that we all grow up into maturity in Christ Jesus. And uh, we are thrilled that the Lord has you with the gifts that he's given you. I'm going to uh, introduce these folks to you briefly. So we have Holly and Steve Olson with their kids on the end here, and then Janice Pletcher, and Mike and Sue Ressler, and Ruth and David Christner, and Celeste and Bobby Johnson, Cheryl Barron. I suppose uh, around here we'll just call Patrick Roll your son rather than calling you Patrick's mother, uh, but we'll, uh, we're glad to have you, Cheryl. Mo Mikowski, Tom and Angie Lohr. We have Marvin Trim, Bobby Braxader, and we have Marion and Gordon Stamper. We're just so thankful that the Lord has brought you among us. I'm just going to ask if you would respond to the five membership questions. You've seen these. We've talked over them in class. You signed uh, them. But as a public profession of your faith, as you join among us, uh, let me ask you these questions. First, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope save in his sovereign mercy? Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance on the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you? And do you promise to support the church and its worship and work to the best of your ability? And finally, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Do you? We are thankful for you. Let me pray briefly for us. Our Lord, we thank you for these folks that you have brought here. We thank you for the gifts that you have given them in Christ. May they be a blessing to us. May we be a blessing to them for Christ's sake. We pray it in his name. Amen. We are just going to greet you briefly while we all sing two verses of Blessed Be the Tithe That Binds. Would you turn with me now to the Lord in prayer? God, how we thank you for the blessing of being part of the family of God, of being part of a body. How we thank you that you did not call us to know Jesus Christ and then set us off on our own, but you gave us one another, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. How I pray that your spirit would equip us to use our gifts and abilities for the service of your people, would you equip us to welcome one another, to encourage one another, to comfort one another, to challenge one another, to be a blessing to one another in the Lord? And as we do so, Father, would you be glorifying the name of Christ among us? May people look at us and see the character of Christ being formed in us. We ask that you would continue to increase our love for you and for one another to increase our righteousness as we seek to follow you and our joy together as your people, we pray. Father, as we think about comforting one another and caring for one another, I do pray for those among us who are sick. I know we have many who are sick with typical seasonal sicknesses, and as we know the weakness of our body, would you strengthen us? Would your healing hand be with us? 
We know of others uh, who have been and are going in for surgeries. We have several surgeries coming up this week, and we pray that uh, the doctors that are involved would be your instruments of, of healing and that you would be with them. And for those, Father, whose sickness is of a greater sort, whose mortality, the shortness and brevity and weakness of life is, is evident, O oh, Father, how we pray that the comfort of the gospel would be with them, that they would know Christ and the hope that they have in you. Father, we also know this was a Thanksgiving weekend, a, a time around the holidays, which while it brings much joy, also brings much sorrow. And so we pray for those among us who have lost loved ones, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, uh, other family members. Father, would you be with them and draw near to them in this time of year especially? May they know the comfort of the presence of Jesus Christ. And Father, we would ask that you would continue to strengthen us and be with us. As we think about the gifts you've given us, Father, I pray that you'd be at work among us. Would you raise up among us evangelists who are gifted and called to take the name of Jesus Christ to those around us? Of course, while I pray for specific people, men, women gifted in evangelism, I pray that we would all be equipped and ready and eager to talk of Jesus Christ. Would you give us a zeal to talk of our Savior, not because we're advertising something about us, but because we know as sinners how much we need Jesus, and we long for others to know as well. Would you give us a burden for those who do not know Christ, and would you be at work among us, we pray, Father. We do pray, of course, that you would also raise up some to go with the good news of Christ around the world. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are scattered throughout the world, telling others about Christ. Would you be with them and strengthen them? I want to pray this morning also, though, for some who are right here locally amongst us, ministering for the sake of the gospel. I pray for Christy Thomas and her work in the York prison, for Ben Swar and his work with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, for Shabu Uman and his work with Evangelism Explosion, for Walt and Lisa Mueller and their ministry with CPYU, for Keith and Bonnie Greer with their ministry to other missionaries with Barnabas International, and for Cheryl Erb with her work with Engaging Disability. Father, we thank you for the way that you have gifted and called these folks among us. Would you strengthen them and encourage them? Would you guide them and be with them for the sake of the gospel and your kingdom? So, Father, we bring all of these requests before you. Now we want to pray together, as you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are thankful for you and your faithfulness. We know the Lord provides for us through his people, and so we want to continue our worship with tithes and offerings now.
Good morning. As we continue our series in the book of Proverbs this morning, we will, be, we will be considering what the Word of God teaches us about the fear of man. Now, the fear of man is a topic worth our consideration for a couple of reasons. First, the fear of man is something we all struggle with, whether we know it or not. It just looks different for different people. The second reason this topic is worth our consideration is because the fear of man is actually a major theme that runs throughout the course of Scripture. But what's surprising is that this phrase, the fear of man, only shows up in the book of Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, it only shows up one time in Proverbs 29, verse 25. This means that instead of looking at multiple verses like we're used to doing in this series, this morning we're only going to focus on this single verse. And Lord willing, we will learn three things about the fear of man. First, we will learn what the fear of man is and the negative impact it has on us. Second, we will learn how God calls us to respond to the fear of man. And then third, we will learn about the benefits of responding to the fear of man God's way. So we will learn what it is and the negative impact it has. We will learn how God calls us to respond to it. And then finally, we will learn about the benefits of responding to the fear of man God's way. So if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles now to Proverbs 29, verse 25. Hear now the reading of God's holy word. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Dear gracious God and heavenly Father, We do thank you that you are a God who condescends to speak and to commune with sinners. We are thankful, Lord, that we can have communion with you through your word. And so, Lord, I pray that you would draw us near to yourself this morning, that you would teach us your word and that you would apply it to our lives so that we could live in a way that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight, and in a way, Lord, that glorifies our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Have you ever had the chance to share the gospel with someone but remained silent because you were nervous about how that person might respond? Or have you ever found yourself in a small group accountability time, feeling convicted that you ought to confess a certain sin, but you kept quiet because you were afraid of what the other members of the group might think of you? Or do you have a hard time saying no to people even though you know you should because you don't want to let them down? Or do you find yourself constantly comparing yourself to other people to see how you stack up against them? Well, if you've answered yes to any of these questions, then you have experienced something that the Bible calls the fear of man. Now, just to be clear, the fear of man or when the Bible talks about the fear of man, it's not talking about the fear of toxic masculinity or anything like that. The word man in the Bible is often used to refer to people in general. Likewise, the word fear in the Bible has a broader meaning than just being scared. And so while it certainly does include being afraid or intimidated by someone, it can also mean to be in awe 
of another person or to be enamored with something. And so the fear of man might best be defined simply as the dread and the awe that we have for other people. The dread and the awe that we have for others. And we see an example of this fear of man in John chapter 12, where we are told that there were authorities in Jerusalem who believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. So, and they did not confess him, so they wouldn't be kicked out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And so we see in this example that the reason the authorities did not confess Jesus was God was because of their fear of man. To be more specific, they were afraid of what the Pharisees would do to them. They feared the Pharisees would kick them out of the synagogue. And the reason they dreaded being kicked out of the synagogue was because they were enamored with the glory or the praise that came from the people of the synagogue. Rather than from God. In other words, these authorities valued what people had to offer them more than they valued God. As a result, they chose not to follow Jesus for fear of losing that which they most treasured. But the question uh, we should ask about these authority figures is, why did they love the glory or the praise they received from people more than they loved Christ? And if we think about it, the answer is rather obvious, isn't it? They loved receiving praise from the people for the same reason that you and I love receiving praise from people. They loved how it made them feel about themselves. It made them feel good, it made them feel special to be admired and liked by so many people. So much so that they weren't willing to give that up. In other words, the real reason these authority figures didn't follow Jesus was because they were conceited and proud. And therefore, they wanted glory for themselves. And they weren't willing to give that up, not even for the sake of of Christ himself. And so the really important thing that this example from John chapter 12 teaches us about the fear of man is that it is rooted and grounded in whoever or whatever we love the most. The fear of man comes from whatever we love the most. But when we get down to the heart of the issue, what we really discover is that what we love the most is ourselves. And therefore, we all naturally think that what we really need the most is whatever will provide us with the greatest amount of comfort, the greatest amount of pleasure, or the greatest amount of glory. And whatever that is will be the thing that we fear losing above all else. And therefore, we will do whatever we can to keep it, to hold on to it, even if it means denying Christ as Lord. And this way of being is cancerous. Not only does it cause great damage to our relationships with others, but it causes great damage to our own souls. Let's just take the marriage relationship as an example. If you think, if what you think you need the most is the love and affection of your spouse, then you're going to do anything you can to get it. The problem, however, 
is anything you do in your marriage is not really about your spouse or for your spouse, is it? It's really about you. And what you're doing is just using your spouse to feel good about yourself. And I am guilty of doing this in my own marriage. I have struggled with this many times. My love language is words of affirmation, or at least that's what I've been told. <laughs> and therefore, I will do deeds of service, things that I know that my wife will appreciate in order to get the words of affirmation that I'm looking for. And so there's a part of me that's not really loving my wife for her sake. I'm loving her for my own sake. I'm loving her so that I can feel good about the kind of husband that I am. I'm loving her so I can feel good about the kind of father I am. The problem with this way of relating to one's spouse, however, is that it's incredibly selfish. And it leads to hurt feelings and resentment when you don't feel like you're getting the recognition or the love that you deserve. The other problem with this way of relating to your spouse is that if you're depending on your spouse to provide you with what you think you need most, then you will be crushed when they don't give it to you. As a result, you are going to do whatever it takes to please them so that you can get what you need. But in doing that, you turn your spouse into an idol that ends up controlling your life. They become little false gods that you worship. And this is a major problem because Scripture tells us that we are to have one God, the one true God, and we are to worship and to serve him alone. So the fear of man sets us in opposition to God, our Father. And the fear of man doesn't just affect marriages. It affects every relationship we have, whether that be with your friends at school, your boss at work, or even the stranger that you happen to have a random interaction with. Because as long as how you feel is dependent to some extent on what other people think of you or how they treat you, then anything that you do or say will be determined by the response that you're hoping to receive from them. As a result, other people will end up controlling how you live your life. Because whether you realize it or not, you have elevated other people to the status of false gods, which you now live to please in order to benefit yourself in some way. And Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, This fear of man lays a snare. Now, a snare is a trap that's hidden, which results in a creature's death. It's a hidden trap that is deadly. And just like the snare, the fear of man is something we don't even notice. Most of the time, we are completely oblivious to our fear of man, not realizing the strangle effect or the poisoning effect that it's having on us and our relationships. But nevertheless, whether you realize it or not, it's going to lead to your destruction. And the reason for that is that other people are sinners, just like you and me. Which means that if we let them control our lives, if we let them have influence over us, they will only lead us into further and further sin. Sin that we will one day be condemned for when we stand before the judgment seat of God. 
And this is the tragic thing about the fear of man. Not only is it something that we are unaware of that's causing us real harm in the present, but it's also something that's going to condemn us in the future when we meet our maker. So then, what hope do we have? How can we overcome this fear of man? This leads me to point number two, how God calls us to overcome it. In Proverbs 29, verse 25, God tells us the only way to overcome the fear of man is by trusting in him. A different proverb, Proverbs uh, 3, verses 5 through 6, gives us the same command in a slightly different way. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. In other words, if we would just humble ourselves, if we would just forsake our pride and completely submit to God and his ways, God will help us overcome our fear of man and show us a better way to live. But what exactly is that better way? What is that better way of living? What is it that God is calling us to? Well, the answer to that question is the same answer to every single Sunday school question that you've ever been asked. That's right, it's Jesus Christ. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And again, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so you see, if we want to avoid the snare that is this fear of man, and if we want to have a better life which leads to eternal life, then we must trust Jesus. We must trust that Jesus is the only way to get there. And we must follow him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But following Jesus is something that's easier said than done. Because following Jesus means leaving behind all worldly sources of comfort, pleasure, and glory. In other words, whatever it is that you have been relying on to meet your needs and your longings, you're going to need to utterly forsake all of them in order to follow Christ. And very often this process feels like death. And this is, this is exactly what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 16, where he says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Did you hear that? In order to save your life, you must be willing to forsake it for the sake of Christ. In order to save your life, you must be willing to deny yourself the comfort, the pleasure, and the glory that you're used to chasing after. And you must be willing to put all idols in your life to death. And so... If I may, I want to speak to families, to people who, have, are, who are married and have children. What I'm saying doesn't mean that you have to leave your family. God would never ask you to do that. 
but it might mean that you have to start making God the priority in your life instead of your wife or your children. And the only way to do that is by committing yourself to live life God's way, to do things the way that God tells us to do them. And so this, for example, it might mean you have to start disciplining your children because God tells us whoever spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is diligent in discipline. Or it might mean that you actually have to put down your phone and stop working and start pursuing your wife. Because God tells us to rejoice in the life of our youth. Or it might mean not letting little Jimmy attend soccer practice on Sundays because God's word tells us to honor the Lord's day as holy. Or it might mean leading your family in family devotions because God tells us to be diligent in teaching his word to our children. And this list could go on and on and on. But the great thing about doing things God's way is that we can rest assured, we can be more confident that we're doing the right things in the right way for the right reasons. We can be more confident that we're not doing it just for ourselves, to please ourselves or to get more glory for ourselves. We can be more confident that we're doing it for Jesus Christ and His glory because that's the only thing that matters. And in doing so, you can free yourself from the bondage that is the fear of man. You can free yourself from the constant worry and anxiety of what others are thinking about you, what others are saying about you what that comment meant over there, or what that comment meant over here. It means you can live your life in fear. I mean, in freedom of this fear of man. Now, you might say, or you might be tempted to say, I don't know, you might be tempted to say, well, all those commandments and all that talk of obedience, that sounds illegal, a little bit legalistic. But I would just ask you, I would gently ask you, dear brother and sister, what exactly do you think it means to trust in Jesus and to follow him? I think it means giving your life to him and living life on his terms and not our own. I think it means leaning not on our own understanding, but acknowledging God by obeying all of his commandments in every aspect of our life. But of course, not in an effort to earn our salvation. That's not possible. But instead, in an effort to follow Christ's example and to demonstrate that you really do trust in him, that when you say you trust in Jesus, you really mean it. And we're not just offering him lip service. In other words, genuine trust in Christ really does show itself through active and ongoing obedience. Let me put it another way. Active obedience is how we throw ourselves in the arms of Christ. Active obedience is how we throw ourselves in the arms of our Savior. And for singles and children, all of this applies just as equally to you too. When it comes to following, when it comes to following Christ, no one gets an easy way out. Following Christ, no matter how old you are or what stage of life that you're in, always involves dying to oneself day after day after day. It involves doing things God's way and not our own way. And so if you're still tempted, though, to shrug this message off, or if you're tempted to say, well, I don't think God would really want me to do anything that hard, or I don't really think that God would want me to suffer that much, then I would just ask you to listen to these words from another proverb. 
Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, which says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is a way of death. Just let those words sink in for a moment. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is a way of death. And so, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I urge you, trust in Jesus and follow him. Don't delay. Don't put it off. Do it at this very moment. And this leads me to point number three, the benefit of responding to the fear of man God's way. Have you ever heard the saying, sometimes the hardest things in life are the ones most worth doing? Well, the same is true for trusting in Christ. Because when we trust in Christ, we overcome our fear of man, which means we become less and less concerned about what other people are going to do or how they're going to think of us. As a result, as followers of Christ, we now have the strength and the ability to say with Peter and the other apostles, we must obey God rather than men. But this doesn't mean life will always be easy. And it doesn't mean that all of our relationships will just be hunky-dory. We need to remember what Christ tells us in Matthew chapter 10. That he did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Meaning that trusting in Christ will have the unfortunate effect of driving a wedge between us and others. And sometimes it will drive a wedge between us and even the people we care about most about, even the people we love the most, who have not yet made the same commitment that we have. It will also make us enemies with the world, which means that we will never have hope of ever feeling comfortable or at home in this life. If you don't feel comfortable in this world, if you feel like an outsider, good, because it means you're following Christ. You should never want to feel at home here. You should always want to feel different. But here's the good news. Though we may lose favor with man, we will never lose favor with God. As a result, there is nothing in this life we need to fear. Just listen to what God tells us in Isaiah 43. He says, Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the, ri through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. And so here's the point. Yes, trusting in Jesus Christ is a very dangerous calling. And yes, it will set us in opposition with other people. And sometimes that will be the people that you love. But through it all, God promises to never leave us nor forsake us. He will walk through the opposition and the persecution with us, and he will be there every step of the way. Amen. And not only will he be there, but in Romans 8.28, which is my fav one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, he tells us that he will actually work all things together for our good. 
meaning that every ounce of pain and hardship that we suffer for the sake of Christ in this life will not be wasted. All of it will be used by God to bless you. All of it will be used by God to cleanse you from the remaining effects of sin in this life and to make you perfect even as he himself is perfect. This means your salvation, your eternal happiness is guaranteed. Nothing can take it away from you. No power in heaven or on earth can take or strip your salvation, the security that you have in Christ, away from you. As a result, there is no hardship in this life, no matter how painful, that can cause you real harm. This is why Proverbs 29, verse 25 tells us, whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. But not only are we safe in this life, we are safe in the life to come. What's more is that when our life on this earth is done and we go to heaven to be with the Lord, God himself will be our reward. On that day, we will get to see him in all of his glory, splendor, and majesty as we behold him face to face. Revelation 21 verse 4 describes that great and awesome day like this. It says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. So not only will the suffering in this life be used for our ultimate good, but we are promised a day in which suffering itself will be no more. Nor will there be any more sin or death for those who trust in God. And so I say to you, I plead with you, trust him. Trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. He is worth it. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word in this proverb. And Lord, we do confess that we have struggled with the fear of man. We have lived for the glory of others more than we have lived for the glory that comes from you. As a result, Lord, we are guilty of committing great acts of sin against you. Would you please have pity on us? Would you have mercy on us? And would you forgive us, not for our sake, but for the sake of your Son, who bled and died so that we might be saved. And Lord, would you grant to us the power of your Holy Spirit that would help us to overcome this fear of man that we have. Would you strengthen and enable us to trust in you more and more each day. Would you help us, Lord, not to be concerned with the things of this world, but would you help us to seek after your kingdom? Lord, do this so that we may live lives that are pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Do this so that Christ might be honored 
in us and through us to the glory of your marvelous being. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.